Hi, my name is Sheila Clausen Weeb, and I teach Bible at Canadian Mennonite University. I invite you to pull out a Bible and open it to Luke 14. I wanted to begin this Bible study with a story about a delicious meal and the rich experience of fellowship that happens around the table. I couldn't do it. I couldn't pick just one story. Memories came flooding in of Christmas dinners with extended family, eating with CMU students from Iraq and Palestine and Paraguay, sharing a meal with Muslim friends in Iran and German friends in Iona, intimate dinners with friends right at this table. The list could go on and on. There's something that happens when you sit across the table with someone, isn't there? You know what I mean. Laughter erupts and tears are shared. Meaningful conversations continue long after the dessert is finished. Bonds of friendship are strengthened. Jesus knew that too. I'm convinced that's why there are so many stories of Jesus eating with people in the Gospels. In the Gospel of Luke especially, Jesus is often either eating or talking about food. Really, it's no wonder that his adversaries called him a glutton and a drunk. The focus of our Bible study today is one of those texts. The story of the great banquet in Luke 14 verses 15 to 24. Jesus engages in table talk and invites us to join in the conversation. Before we get at the specifics of the text, there are some context matters we need to keep in mind. We might think of them as the social cultural context, the literary context, and the theological context. First, it's important to remember that eating with people is never just about the food. That's true today, but it was even more the case in the first century Mediterranean world. Meals were social occasions that marked boundaries and established hierarchies. Generally, people ate with their own social classes and seating arrangements solidified status differences. Cultural values of honor and shame also came into play. To honor someone meant to give them the respect and esteem that their status in the community warranted. Also important in ancient society was the ethics of reciprocity. Gifts and meal invitations were given with the expectation that the favor would be returned. People with status then would never consider inviting the poor to a meal since they could not reciprocate and would dishonor the host. A second thing to consider when we read the parable of the great banquet is what comes before and after the text. Luke 14 consists of a series of interactions between Jesus and the religious teachers. This is actually the third time in Luke that Jesus dines with the Pharisees. And all three times, Jesus criticizes their social practices and teaches them about God's radical hospitality. These stories are literally table talk. Luke 14 begins with Jesus going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees for a Sabbath meal. Once at the meal, Jesus notices the guests trying to get seats of honor close to the host and tells them that those who exalt themselves will be humbled and the humble will be lifted up. He then turns to the host, urging him to give dinner parties, not just to people of his own social class, but to the outcasts who can't repay the invitation. It's at this point that one of the dinner guests makes a pious comment about eating bread in the kingdom, which prompts Jesus to tell a story about a great banquet. Right after our text, the setting changes. Jesus warns the crowds following him that people who cling to family, possessions, and even life itself cannot be his disciples. One final thing to remember when we read Luke 14 is that feasting is a theological metaphor. We're reminded of this in verse 15, when one of the guests says, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. The image of the end time reign of God as a sumptuous feast is present in the Old Testament already. Isaiah 25 verse six says, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the leaves of fat things full of marrow. Now, fat and bone marrow don't sound so appealing to me, but how about this? In God's end time reign, God will prepare for all peoples a feast featuring grilled wild salmon on a bed of lemon dill risotto with a side of strawberry spinach salad, chocolate fudge tort with raspberry coulis for dessert. Are you hungry yet? Jesus works with this image of God's reign as a banquet when he says in Luke 13 verse 29, then people will come from east and west, from north and south, and will eat in the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't just talk about God's kingdom as a feast, though. 
He actually embodied it. When Jesus ate with people, Pharisees and tax collectors, disciples and crowds of 5,000, he was yanking that future kingdom into the present. In his table fellowship, Jesus was announcing, the end time feast of God has begun. Everyone dig in. So it is that when Jesus is at one of those meals, someone in the group piously pipes up, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. He's going to be one of those blessed ones, and Jesus ought to know it. Jesus responds, as he often does with the story. Someone gave a great dinner and invited many, the story begins. Everything about the parable suggests that the people in it are well off. Poor peasants can't afford to give great dinners. Moreover, the invited guests seem to have resources. The first one has just bought land. The fact that he hasn't seen it yet suggests he might be an absentee landlord. The second has just purchased five pair of oxen. In those days, a yoke of oxen was one of the most valuable resources a farmer could own. Think plow, cedar, fertilizer, and combine all wrapped up into one. Five pair of oxen is enough to farm about 100 acres of land, a fortune in those days. Both the host and the guests in the story are well off, just like the religious leaders with whom Jesus is dining. What happens next in the story is really quite astonishing and embarrassing. At the last minute, everyone jams out. Putting on a feast in those days would have required a two-stage invitation. The host would need to have firm RSVPs weeks in advance in order to know how much meat to prepare. Then, when everything was ready, a second call would go out. Can you imagine everyone cancelling at the last minute? Remember what I said about first century cultural values of honour and shame. Some commentators think that the guests must have had a grudge against the host and decided together to shame him. Certainly the nature of the excuses highlight their extreme rudeness. Kenneth Bailey, a New Testament scholar who lived many years in the Middle East, sheds light on what these excuses would sound like to a Palestinian villager. He says, quote, no one buys a field in the Middle East without knowing every square foot of it like the palm of his hand. And the process of buying a field is long and complicated, unquote. Clearly the guest is telling a bald-faced lie. Secondly, buying five yoke of oxen sight unseen would be like someone saying to his best her best friend, oh, I can't come to your daughter's wedding tonight after all. I just bought five used cars on Kijiji and I have to see if they start your friend would no longer be your friend. The first two excuses both end with, I beg you, have me excused. The third guest simply says, I got married and so I can't come. He doesn't even ask to be excused. One scholar comments, quote, jilting an elite male host in order to have sex with one's wife amounted to a stinging slap in the host's face, end quote. In short, these are three blatantly flimsy excuses. The guests might just as well have said, I don't want to come. My property and household obligations are more important to me than you. It's no wonder that right after this, Jesus harshly warns the crowds that possessions and family can be insurmountable obstacles to discipleship. You would expect the host to retaliate by shaming his ungrateful guests. It's true, the host does get angry, but instead of opting for revenge, he chooses radical hospitality and generosity. He does what Jesus said one should do when giving a dinner. He invites people from a lower social class who cannot reciprocate and who can't possibly repair his honor. First, the poor, lame, and blind are invited, and then, when there is still room, the even more marginalized, who live in the lanes and hedges outside the city. In fact, the householder says, compel them to come in. People who are used to being excluded, ignored, and demeaned would need some convincing before they would take seriously a rich guy's invitation to dinner. It's curious to me why the attempt to fill the house takes place in two stages. In the past, some commentators have taken this to represent Jesus' invitation, first to the outcasts of Israel and then to the Gentiles. But there's nothing into the, in the text to suggest that the Gentile mission is being prefigured here. Is it to emphasize the size of the banquet hall, the magnanimity of the host, or maybe just to reinforce that, yeah, really all people are invited, 
even the riffraff on the outskirts, whom no one would want. But you do have to accept the invitation. And so there are some, says Jesus, who won't taste the dinner. So what is this parable about and what might it be saying to the church today? I want to suggest three different angles, depending on which characters in the story we identify with and what part of the literary context we focus on. First of all, the parable can be understood as Jesus' response to the smug listener who blesses those who will eat bread in the kingdom, by which he means himself and his cronies. Jesus tells a story to unsettle his assumptions about God's kingdom. When the reign of God comes in full, it will be like a magnificent feast with fabulous food and wine, laughter and rich conversation. But here's the catch. Literally everyone is invited even and especially the people who have been consistently told that they are not enough. Not smart enough, religious enough, well-connected enough, important enough. I suspect most of us attending this study conference don't fit easily into that category. Most of us have power and privilege, but maybe not all. Maybe some of you listening to this are on the margins of the church and have somehow got the message that you're not really welcome at the party. In the parable of the great banquet, Jesus tells you that you are. Everyone is welcome at God's party. Now, of course, God is not a God who invites the poor and outcast only after the real guests decline. That's God's party. Such people are invited right from the beginning. That message is good news. The flip side, of course, is that the parable is also a warning, as verse 24 shows. The parable is addressed to the well-off, to people with religious and social power who are self-assured and self-satisfied. Jesus' message to them is that expectations are going to be turned upside down. We might be tempted to distance ourselves from this audience because they are, after all, Jesus' enemies and we are not. But elsewhere, Jesus actually gives similar warnings to the crowds and the disciples, people like us. Perhaps we in the church are more like the guests who decline the invitation than we think. Maybe we too have become so enamored with security, so addicted to material well-being, so seduced by privilege, that we're in danger of passing up the feast of a lifetime. Does the church today still need Jesus? Or are we so comfortable that we can no longer hear his invitation to join the feast? The parable is a warning as well as good news. A third way to think about the parable is, is as an example of what Jesus told his host right before the parable. When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind. The list of people named here is identical to those in the story. The parable, then, is a story of a person who put into practice the message Jesus taught. This is something that the status-conscious elites of Jesus' day needed to hear. It's also a message Luke intended for his own audience, since some of them were probably wealthy. Theophilus, to whom the gospel is addressed, may have been a rich benefactor of the church. The message is also one the church today needs to hear. The church in North America is a well-off householder with resources to give a magnificent banquet. Whom are we inviting to the table? The people who are just like us? Or do we have the courage, the creativity, and the compassion to open wide our doors to people who, may, who we may have intentionally or unintentionally excluded from the feast? Those people may be the homeless, the poor, the immigrant, but we Mennonites often feel pretty good about our social justice efforts. Maybe the people we've excluded from the feast include the neighbor on the other end of the political spectrum, whether right or left, or the LGBTQ young adult peeking in the door, or the soldier who just came back from Afghanistan, or the neighbor struggling with addiction, or what do we, the church, need to say or do to convince people used to being excluded that we really mean it? Do we really mean it? How do we need to change? To conclude, imagine Jesus sitting at the table with us here today, engaging in table talk the way he did with leaders of his faith community long ago. 
I'm not sure what kind of story he'd tell, but if it were anything like the parable of the great banquet, I think we'd come, I think we'd come away convinced of three things. One, we'd realize that God is preparing a fabulous party with food and fellowship beyond anything we've ever imagined. At that party will be people that we wouldn't expect to see there, people that would never darken the door of the church today. Jesus has invited them all to the table, and he invites you. Two, the main point of the parable, I think, is that some people are in danger of missing out. We might be more like that smug dinner guest or the religious leaders than we'd care to admit. Most of us have, have an abundance of property, possessions, and family connections. Jesus would warn us today, be careful. Be very, very careful that you don't get so preoccupied with these things that you end up missing the party. Three, the church needs to learn to give a party the way God gives a party. We need to be convinced that the feast God is preparing is indeed good news for the world and then open our arms wide. How can we convince others to come eat with us if we're not sure we want to taste the meal ourselves? The task of the church today is to imagine what God's banquet will be like and then help make that feast a reality. Actually, that's not quite right. God's party has already begun. The banquet is happening whether we are paying attention or not. We just need to dig in. And when you bump elbows with someone you don't think should be there, start a conversation. Let's do table talk in Jesus' way.